This talk is going to specifically focus on atrial fibrillation and flutter and the management of these conditions, um, particularly as regards anticoagulation. These are your arrhythmia learning outcomes up until phase three. In the red, I've added a additional or more specific outcome that I think is really important to your learning when it comes to arrhythmias. And that is regarding understanding cardioembolic stroke risk that is associated with both atrial fibrillation and flutter and how we go about calculating and managing this risk balanced against the risk of bleeding and thinking about how we would communicate that to patients and involve them in decision making. Let's start with a focus on atrial fibrillation. One of the reasons that it's so important that you have a really good grasp of AF is because it is so common. So in the general population, up to about 1% will have AF. But once you get to the over 65s, 10% of the population will have AF. So this is a condition that as a junior doctor, you are going to see over and over again and often is something that you will be expected to manage on some sort of level as a F1. So in ideal normal circumstances, the electrical activity in the heart will be initiated in the SA node, and then this will propagate through the atria in a organised fashion leading to contraction of the atria at the end of di diastole before the start of ventricular systole and this atrial contraction gives that extra 20 to 30 percent ejection of blood into the left ventricle before systole occurs and that blood is pumped out of the aorta. In comparison, in atrial fibrillation, there are multiple foci of electrical impulses, and these are chaotic. So you've not got that organised electrical activity within the atria, and therefore you've not got that organised contraction within the atria. As we don't have a organised electrical signal coming from the SA node, there is no distinct P wave on the ECG. The multiple foci and chaotic activity going on in the atria in atrial fibrillation is usually running at over 300 beats per minute and it is the AV node that is stopping the all of that activity getting through to the ventricles and causing a very fast ventricular rate. So it can be really quite variable how much of those electrical impulses are passing through and so it can be quite variable what the ventricular rate will be. This also means that as it's only some of that activity that's being blocked, that ventricular rate is irregular. So a quick look at some ECG examples. So again, we'd want to approach this in a nice structured modular way. So starting with, is there a P wave consistently before every QRS complex? And here there is not. So we can already begin to think that the electrical activity in this individual was not coming from the SA node. But we carry on with our analysis and start looking at whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. And here it's quite clearly irregular. And then we'd want to think about the rate. 
because it's a irregular rhythm we can't use the 300 rule so instead if we count along the number of QRS complexes in the rhythm strip at the bottom and multiply that by 6 so remember the ECG is reading for 10 seconds so if we multiply that number by 6 that, that gives us the number of complexes in 60 seconds so 1 minute here I think there are 13 QRS complexes in that 10 seconds so multiply that by 6 we've got a rate of 78 beats per minute so we would of course want to carry on further going through our structured analysis of this ECG particularly thinking about arrhythmias we would want to note that this is a narrow complex so the QRS complexes um, the duration is less than 120 milliseconds. So already with this ECG, we can conclude that it is a narrow, complex, irregularly irregular rhythm at approximately 80 beats per minute with no discernible P waves. So our conclusion would be that this is likely rate-controlled atrial fibrillation. Here's another example. So looking for P waves, there's no definite consistent P wave before every QRS. The rhythm is irregularly irregular. The QRS is narrow. And again, we wouldn't be able to use the 300 rule because it's irregular. So this would involve counting out all of those QRS complexes in the bottom rhythm strip and multiplying by 6. If my counting is correct, there are 22 QRS complexes. Multiply that by 6 and we have a ventricular rate of 132 beats per minute. So obviously we would go on to look at further detail within this ECG, but we can already conclude that this is a narrow, complex, irregularly irregular ECG at 132 beats per minute with no discernible P waves. So this would be an example of fast atrial fibrillation. Let's now talk about why atrial fibrillation matters. Firstly, people can feel really unwell when they're in AF to a point that it really affects their quality of life. I don't think I fully appreciated this until one of my colleagues developed paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And I can now literally go into work and without examining that individual or feeling their pulse from the other side of the room, tell whether that individual has gone into AF. It's almost become a bit like a party trick and that's just because some people just feel really unwell with it to a point that you can you can see on their face that they are not enjoying that day. So it, it really really can impact people's quality of life even if they're not going particularly fast but usually it's fast atrial fibrillation that people feel really symptomatic with even if they're not specifically getting palpitations. Next, being in particularly fast atrial fibrillation, if that's persistently been going on for weeks, months at a time, and some people really don't feel palpitations so they may not know or they may not have presented to their GP or to the hospital and if that's been going on for a good long while that can result in really quite a dramatic de decline in their left ventricular function. So we could refer to this as a tachy induced cardiomyopathy and it's not that uncommon that we see people present in severe heart failure and the underlying etiology of that heart failure is that they've been in fast AF undiagnosed for weeks or months. And actually, once you've, you've rate controlled that AF and managed that, 
the heart function will dramatically improve, usually back to normal. Another issue with AF is because you've not got that coordinated atrial depolarization and therefore you've not got that coordinated atrial contraction, you lose that, what we can refer to as an atrial kick, so that contraction of the atria that is ejecting that extra 20-30% into the left ventricle before we get ventricular systole. And that can really dramatically affect how some people are managing their heart function. Now this is particularly in respect to people that have already got an impaired heart function. So it's not uncommon that we see patients that have, say, severe left ventricular failure and they've actually been managing that fairly well and have been fairly asymptomatic and then suddenly they have a dramatic decline in terms of their symptoms and how they're doing in terms of their heart failure and then it turns out that the, the underlying cause of that is that they've suddenly gone into AF and losing that extra 30% ejection from the atria has significantly impacted a what was previously a relatively stable patient. So for those individuals trying to manage that atrial fibrillation and ideally get them back into sinus rhythm can be utterly essential in terms of managing their symptoms and their quality of life. And probably the most important thing about AF is as regards cardioembolic stroke risk. So that lack of coordinated activity in the atria means that blood is relatively static. And static blood is designed to clot. That's what happens when you cut yourself. The blood is no longer moving, so it, it clots. We don't want clots forming in the heart. Particularly in the atria, they will form or settle out in an area called the left atrial appendage, which is a, a slight outpouching of the left atrium, which, because it's a relatively quiet zone, that, that tends to be where clot forms. And that clot can then be ejected into the left ventricle and can pass up out of the aorta. And one of the places where it can end up getting lodged, although it can end up in all sorts of places, one of the places that we, we more commonly see it and where we worry about it is in the cerebral arteries. And this can result in absolutely catastrophic ischemic strokes. Briefly to talk about one of the ways that we can classify atrial fibrillation. You've probably already heard people talking about paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. This refers to where people are having intermittent episodes of AF between going back into sinus rhythm. And these are terminating spontaneously without us giving any medical intervention. We can then refer to AF as being persistent, and this means where that episode can be terminated, but it is requiring some form of medical intervention. And then there are individuals that, we, that have what we describe as permanent atrial fibrillation. So these are individuals where, despite medical intervention, we haven't managed to re-establish sinus rhythm or we've not managed to re-establish it for any substantial amount of time. It's probably also worth noting at this point, because you'll see it written in notes probably all the time, that when we write PAF, that's basically doctor shorthand for paroxysmal AF. Although, word of warning, people often use paroxysmal and persistent interchangeably. Generally, we just mean somebody that is not in AF all the time.
Let's go back to the key take home message of this talk though, which really is about anticoagulation and stroke risk with AF. Just to reiterate, we've got a chaotic atrial rate going at over 300 beats per minute with no real effective contraction and movement of blood. People sometimes describe it as almost wriggling like a bag of worms with no distinct contraction and relaxation. That static blood in the atria and particularly in the atrial appendage can result in clot formation and this clot formation can result in stroke. We try to quantify a patient with AF's risk of stroke through the CHADS2 VAS score. So let's go through that briefly to try and pull out the different components of the CHADS2 VAS. So firstly, you get a point if you have evidence of congestive heart failure or left ventricular systolic dysfunction. You get a point for having a diagnosis of hypertension, even if that's managed on medication. You can get zero, one or two points for age. So if you're less than 65, you don't get any points for that. 65 to 74 is one point and anybody 75 or above gets two points on age. Diabetics get a point, that's both type 1 and type 2 diabetics. You get two points if you've had a previous stroke, transient ischemic attack or any form of thromboembolic disease. There's a point for having vascular disease and by vascular disease we mean previous um, myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, aortic plaque, those, those sort of events, there's a point in it for that. There's also a point for being female. It's um, all about hormones, girls. Um, but there is a slight caveat to that that I'll talk about briefly in a moment. So points would mean prizes if getting an anticoagulant was a prize and basically it's, a, it's an ad additive effect so you clock up points according to what your past medical history is. So, and then that allows us to work out firstly a risk score in terms of the yearly risk of stroke and then it guides management. So anybody with a score of one, but in the exception of where that score is based on sex alone. So by that I mean if you've got no other risk factors and you're a female, we wouldn't offer anticoagulation. Any other score of one, it's a consider according to NICE guidelines and the evidence. So I think what that really means is that you need to have a long conversation with the patient about their risks and make a joint decision with the patient about whether they would want to have anticoagulation or not. A score of two or above means that we would always offer the patient an oral anticoagulant. But again, it's absolutely crucial that those discussions and informed discussions are had with the patient about their risk of stroke and as we'll go on to also the risk of bleed with taking anticoagulation. This is really just to highlight how serious this topic is and what the absolutely devastating consequences of 
either not anticoagulating and unfortunately sometimes anticoagulating people with atrial fibrillation can be. So we've got 10% of over 65s that have AF and a lot of those will have comorbidities. In fact, just a bit on the merit of being in that over 65 age group, you get at least one point on your Chad's to score. So these patients are nearly always going to be offered anticoagulation. If we don't identify these patients, if they don't, if we don't have appropriate conversations with them, if for whatever reason they don't have anticoagulation, a real risk of that is what is shown here on the left, a large ischemic stroke. However, there are always a certain proportion of patients that regardless of whether everything is done absolutely correctly and their dosing of their anticoagulation is done with absolute precision, there will be a population of people on anticoagulation that go on to have hemorrhagic stroke. And both of these images, these CT scans that you see here, these strokes would have caused either loss of life or a huge degree of morbidity. So it is something to really, really learn about and really, really consider when you come to actually practicing as a junior doctor. So we're trying to prevent ischemic stroke but the downside is that anticoagulation can result in hemorrhage. It can result in hemorrhage in all sorts of areas, but again, the brain is one place. So before we anticoagulate someone, we really need to think about also about their risk of bleed. And this is where the has bled score comes in. And this is really thinking about those other factors that give patients a higher bleeding risk, risk, such as uncontrolled hypertension, abnormal liver function where they're not producing good clotting factors, whether they've got any other prior major bleeding disposition, uh, drinking alcohol and in high volumes can also impact this and what other drugs they're taking. So if they're already taking aspirin and clopidogrel, we, we need to think about whether that needs to continue if we're gonna add in a anticoagulant. But one of the real key reasons why it's important that we calculate these risk scores, the CHADS2 VAS and the has bled, is to aid our communication with patients. It's not something that I want to take on alone without having a really, really clear, sensible conversation with the patient. If they've got capacity, they are autonomous individuals who are able to make their own choices. We would recommend that people with suitable CHADS2 VAS scores have anticoagulation for their atrial fibrillation. But this needs to be done in coordination with the patient and understanding their views, their lifestyle, and where they understand that the consequence of taking anticoagulation is that there is some degree of risk of bleed. And if we can communicate to them an actual percentage of stroke risk and a percentage of bleed risk, that can help inform those discussions and make things really, really clear for the patient before they start any of these medications. So talking about medications, it used to be warfarin that was what we used for anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. Things have very much moved on from there in most respects. So now our first line choice for anticoagulation in AF is a DOAC, so a direct oral anticoagulation agent.
you will still come across patients who take warfarin. Certainly, uh, some of our older population people that have been on warfarin for a good, good long while, they sometimes want to stay on warfarin. It's what they're familiar with. Sometimes even having the monitoring of getting to go to the GP, having their INR taken, it's become part of their life. It's something they're comfortable with. It's something they almost enjoy having that regular sort of checkup. And if they don't want to change, then I feel that's absolutely fine. So I will I will leave those people on warfarin. They will be offered a DOAC, but if they're happy on the warfarin and they want to stay on it, that's fine. The other time that you're going to see patients on warfarin is if they have metal heart valves. At the moment, we still use warfarin first line for metal heart valve anticoagulation. And we can talk about metal heart valves in the future. But for the majority of people, our new diagnoses of AF, they are going to be offered a DOAC as first line. So again, if they have a chance to do VASCOR of one, we may consider a DOAC with the patient. If they have a chance to VASCOR, score of two or above according to the NICE guidelines all of those patients should be offered a DOAC. The other form of anticoagulation that you will occasionally see especially in inpatients with atrial fibrillation sometimes we will use a low molecular weight heparin. This is either sometimes used as a bridging therapy. It can be relatively easy to start and stop. So somebody that is having surgery or some sort of procedure that has a bleeding risk that we think we may want to, to stop that anticoagulation for a brief while, we sometimes bridge them with low molecular weight heparin. The other time we use it is in patients with severe renal failure, so um, a creatinine clearance of less than 15. Um, those patients can't take DOAX. They can take warfarin, but in some circumstances that I won't go into, we would wish to avoid warfarin. So sometimes those patients are managed on a long-term low molecular weight heparin. And in York, that would um, always be a noxaparin for those patients. So a brief bit about the DOAX. There are four main choices, adoxaban, apixaban, rivaroxaban and dibigatran. And you will probably find that in different trusts that you train or work in, there may be different preferences to which one of these is used. Um, a lot of this decision making is actually made at a high up management level and certainly cost comes into it. In York, our current first line choice is adoxaban and I don't really have a much better explanation for this than it's cheaper. Um, um, but we used to certainly use a Pixaban up until a year or two ago. That was our first line choice in York. And each one of these has slightly different advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's quite interesting to look at the different bleeding risks against the efficacy of actually preventing strokes. They're relatively all much for muchness. I would have thought most trusts will be using either a doxaban or a pixaban. But they've all got slightly different issues and slightly different guidelines in terms of how we use them. So, for example, a doxaban is a once daily dosing in comparison to a pixaban, which is a twice daily dosing. So that can be an advantage, particularly in the elderly where they might already have a high tablet burden or they're going to do better at remembering to take a tablet, which is just once a day. Rivaroxaban is again a once daily dosing. We actually use this in York as first line for pulmonary embolism, but it's uncommon that we use it simply for atrial fibrillation again alone. 
Um, Rivaroxaban, yeah, it's a once daily dosing, but one of the things with Rivaroxaban is that it needs to be taken alongside food. Um, and again, if people have a poor oral intake in a more elderly population, that can sometimes be an issue. So, and there's also a compliance thing there of do people really do what we tell them to do? And again, the consequences in terms of whether they're actually getting effective absorption of that drug and whether it really is um, giving them that stroke risk reduction, that, that really matters. The other thing that we really need to think of with the DOAX is regarding renal function. So these are all largely excreted renally. And so checking someone's creatinine clearance, um, we often run on a estimated, so an EGFR, but really all of the, the guidelines that evidence is actually based on creatinine clearance. So really we should be calculating this properly with a Cockroft GOAT. Um, I don't know if you guys have gone into that yet, but you will certainly come across it at some point. Um, so a doxaban needs a dose reduction to a smaller dose at a much higher creatinine clearance. Whereas a pixaban, you don't re dose reduce it until your creatinine clearance gets down to below 30. And so all of these things are something that we really need to consider because obviously if we're not giving the patient the right dose of the drug they could either end up in a scenario where they're not getting that ischemic embolic stroke risk protection or on the other side of the scale they could be ending up with too much of that anticoagulation in their system and therefore being at much higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke. All of the DOACs are cautioned or ill-advised to be given with people that have a creatinine clearance of less than 15. There are also a number of other medications that can interact with these drugs. Similar to warfarin, you have to think about what else the patient is taking and what that's going to do in terms of their stroke risk, either ischemic or hemorrhagic. Um, adoxaban particularly will interact with some of the antibiotics such as erythromycin, um, antifungals, ketoconazole. These all need to be taken into consideration. Um, another thing that we think about is a patient's BMI. If their BMI is particularly low, they may need a dose reduction. Um, we don't really change the dosing according to whether they're particularly large or obese, but probably if you look at the finer print of the evidence, then actually there may be some evidence that they, they're not as effective in people that are overweight. The other thing that people tend to be concerned about or think about with the DOAX is reversal agents. So warfarin, giving vitamin K will reverse warfarin. And so when the DOAX first came out, there was a lot of concern that there wasn't reversal agents in the same way that there are with warfarin. Now, in my actual practice, from what I've experienced, this I too would have shared this concern, but in reality, actually this doesn't seem such a major concern anymore because unfortunately the reality is if people have a major hemorrhagic event worrying about reversing the bleed is often rather like worrying about closing the stable door after the horse has bolted it is something that we would try if we could as a last ditch attempt but if they've had a large sudden bleed, by the time we've actually reversed that agent, the, the catastrophic damage is probably already done. That said, we are now getting to the point that we do have reversal agents for some of the DOACs. The Bigatran was the first DOAC to have a reversal agent, so Praxbind is available. I've never used it. I don't think I've ever actually seen it used. Um, 
It's not the cheapest drug. It's getting close to about £3,000 per dose. But in comparison to some other things, it, it is usable in a circumstance where it was clinically appropriate. Um, one of the reasons I haven't seen it used may be because we barely ever see patients on dabigatran in York. There is in development, and I think it is now FDA um, approved, a reversal agent, agent that works for both apixaban and rivaroxaban. I've never seen it used. I don't know that it would actually be available locally. And my understanding is cost at the moment of that drug would be over £20,000 per dose. Moving on to other things that we would do in terms of atrial fibrillation management. Firstly, making sure that we have good rate control so that the ventricular rate is reasonable to give reasonable heart function um, is important. Drugs that we would use for that, beta blockers, rate limiting calcium channel blockers such as diltiazam and digoxin is the other one. Um, I tend to find that medical students and maybe F1 doctors are pretty nervous of digoxin and perhaps there are different trusts and different departments that do things differently. We certainly use a fair amount of this um, for rate control in York. If it's done safely and you have a close eye on the patient's renal function, it can be a brilliant drug for quickly getting a patient's ventricular rate under control in terms of atrial fibrillation. Um, I think there are other trusts that maybe lean slightly more towards giving beta blockers. Metoprolol is fairly quick acting in terms of rate control, but the downside of using that is it can have a significant impact on a patient's blood pressure. There are also other side effects that you can get with metoprolol. And then you will also hear about rhythm control. So this is really about trying to get a patient back into sinus rhythm. There are medical medications that can pharmacologically cardiovert, so get a patient back into sinus, and these can also be um, effective in terms of preventing further episodes. These are not drugs that you would be prescribing as a F1 doctor. I hope this is something that would be reserved for specialist cardiology, um, probably at a consultant level or a, a cardiology registrar level. But they're certainly out there and it can be used. The other thing we can use is electrical cardioversion. So this is basically trying to turn the computer off and on again, reset things so that hopefully then the, the sinus, the SA node, which is what the heart really naturally wants to do in terms of um, electrical impulse generation, will, will override and come back in. We would use cardioversion acutely if somebody was hemodynamically unwell, although we do need to take stroke risk into consideration. We also do these electively for patients that are in persistent atrial fibrillation that we feel we have a good chance of getting back into sinus rhythm. We've also already talked about anticoagulation AF. Other things we can do is we can do some procedures, um, left atrial ablation, um, particularly this can involve um, pulmonary vein isolation. So this is going in with a catheter and what we know is that often the source of the abnormal electrical impulses in AF comes from the pulmonary veins. And so what they can do is create some scar tissue um, near the pulmonary veins and this can stop electrical activity or impulse travelling through to the atria. So there can be the, these percutaneous catheter procedures 
that we would offer patients in order to try and stop them repeatedly going back into atrial fibrillation. A, another option that is fairly recent um, that again may not be available in all centres is something called a left atrial appendage occlusion. So that area, the left atrial appendage, which is usually where the, the clot is coming from, that can actually be closed off and occluded. So either surgically or percutaneously with a device put in there. This can be a particularly useful technique for people who have atrial fibrillation but also have a really high bleeding risk, say someone that has atrial fibrillation but has also had a hemorrhagic stroke, that you wouldn't want to risk giving a, a anticoagulant, a, anticoagulant to. So these patients, they can certainly at the moment be considered for referral for a left atrial appendage occlusion. And I imagine by the time you guys graduate, these procedures may be being more commonly performed and may be developed. Um, so it's something to maybe watch this space in terms of development in. And then we'll just talk very briefly about atrial flutter. So instead of in the normal activity where you have a nice electrical impulse coming through the SA node progressing through the atria and causing contraction, and unlike AF where you've got multiple chaotic foci, in flutter, what you have is a self-perpetuating re-entrant loop around the atria, and it's usually the right atria. And what this gives you on the ECG is often described as a sawtooth pattern. This ECG is an example of a atrial flutter with two to one block. And so you can see in particularly the inferior leads, so 2, 3 and AVF, in between those QRS complexes, you can see a, a couple of flutter waves. And usually these waves are going at, well, the, the rate of that um, re-entrant loop within the atria is going at 300 beats per minute. So usually there's about one flutter wave for each one of those big boxes. And here you've got two flutter waves for each QRS complex. So we'd call this atrial flutter with two to one block. As it's a consistent number of waves that is being blocked or a consistent number that is being transmitted through the AV node to the ventricles, the ECG is regular. And because the atria are running at 300 beats per minute in a, two, in a two to one block for atrial flutter, you will see a very classic heart rate of bang on 150 beats per minute. And this is generally unvaried. So simply by looking at someone's observation chart and seeing that every single time that their pulse is done they are at 150 beats per minute you can start to think that this could well be flutter with two to one block a a sinus rhythm will not give you that sort of rate the rate is going to fluctuate that's either going to be a flutter with two to one or some other significant arrhythmia but the chances are it's flutter Here is a example of a atrial flutter with four to one block. Again, that block's consistent, so you've got a regular rhythm. However, 
you can get instances where patients get a variable block with their atrial flutter and in these instances you will get a irregular rhythm. The real take home message with atrial flutter however is that really in terms of management especially as regards stroke risk you should consider it much the same as atrial fibrillation. So as with a atrial fibrillation patient you want to be calculating a CHADS2 VAS score for ischemic stroke risk, you want to be thinking about a has blood score or bleeding risk and effectively communicating that to the patient and making a decision alongside the patient um, as to whether that patient should be taking a oral anticoagulant. Um, there are similar issues as with AF, um, with rhythm and rate control. Flutter is classically a bit more difficult to manage with medication. Um, we're probably more likely to think about electrically cardioverting someone out of flutter. Um, and again, you'd want to be thinking about performing an echo to check LV function. That's it for now. Hopefully you found that useful in terms of thinking about stroke risk and other management issues with AF and flutter.